further ado, it is an absolute pleasure to introduce our guest this morning. He has been a principal contributor to Spark Lab since its inception. Uh, and it's a delight to have a conversation with Sir Ray Avery today. It's a thrill to have the colossus of innovation in Christchurch. Sir Ray's CV is so voluminous, so triumphant, that it nearly rivals the girth of the Encyclopedia Britannicas he used to read as a kid. Uh, Sir Ray has unleashed his expertise, of course, far and wide in pharmaceuticals, in science, project management, product design, he has helped to create disruptive ideas uh, to confront serious health challenges throughout the developing world. And of course, he is lauded for his big hearted philanthropy. And I'm sure you'd agree that his best selling autobiography, Rebel with a Cause, is widely considered by many, many Kiwis as their go to inspirational Bible. Please join me in welcoming Sir Ray Avery. Now, Sir Ray, before we tackle the rules of innovation, which I know you're very big on, I suppose for the benefit of everyone here in the room and watching uh, on the stream, um, I'm keen to start with your backstory because it is a pretty remarkable story. Your formative years through childhood and adolescence, extreme is one word that comes to mind. Fill us and let's start from the beginning in Blighty. Right, well, I was brought up um, in uh, orphanages in the UK for the first 14 years of my life. Um, my father uh, met my mum in a pub. He'd just been uh, locked up in a prisoner of war camp for five years in Poland, so he obviously got back to Blighty, was up for a bit of a party, met my mum in a pub, and she was obviously up for a bit of a party, and I was the result. Uh, <laughs> but it turned out they didn't like each other much, and they didn't like me, so they put me into orphanages, and... Um, I, that, that's where I resided for the first 14 years. And these were terrible places because they were Dickensian, they, uh, they weren't organised, we used to have to grow our own vegetables in this sort of icy, uh, icy ground and then we had to peel them and cook them for the people that were supposed to look, be looking after us. And I thought this was all a bit rubbish so I, I did what I could so, and I just would run away, you know, I'd run away and I did a kind of um, catch-22, I practised running away. So I ran away for a week and then I ran away for a month. At the age of um, 14 I ran away for good and set up shop under a railway bridge in London. Um, but apart from all of those, um, those bad things, one of the things that uh, was good about all of that was uh, that two things made me the man I am today. One is that that annealing that you get in that brutal society means you're not frightened of anything. You know, it's really, you know, when you've been abused physically, sexually, mentally, and you get out of that and survive, then you think the only way that I can get back at these people is actually be really successful. So don't be a victim of things that happen to you. So that's the first lesson. But then the other thing was that I, I circumvented the education system. That's brilliant. Because our education system is the worst thing for innovators. Because what we do, uh, the education system is predicated on the uh, industrial revolution where we had to educate a whole mass of people very quickly to make uh, use of them in the industrial revolution so they had to have numeracy and they had to have literacy so they had to be able to read instructions and write numbers down so they could be forced into all of these machine shops and do their jobs but of course they didn't need to have any creativity in the curriculum and today there's still nothing on the curriculum globally about creativity and team building so what we've done is we've educated innovation out of people day one. And I was lucky because I didn't get involved in that. Um, in fact, I was lucky because I had acute glue ear because of the poor living conditions. I couldn't hear what they were saying at school. And I had needed glasses and nobody gave me glasses, never checked me for glasses. So I couldn't see the board, didn't know what they were doing up the front. For me, it was just a play, you know, people do. <laughs> but it gave me one skill that I've got that I use every day, which is the precursor to every invention in the whole world. And that is the power of observation. Power observation is the root derivative of every invention that's ever been done. Um, it's the application of knowledge using two bits of information that just seem disparate, putting them together and you, you see something that everybody else misses. And I was trained to do that as a kid because that's all I had. So I didn't get involved in the education system. While you guys were learning algebra, I was living under a railway bridge in London and every day I'd go and read the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's like Google of the day. So I know a lot of shit, you know. <laughs> You know, so, and that's another thing, knowledge, the broader your knowledge is, the more likely you are to be able to come up with something that's clever. And the next best thing to that is us, just the power of us. 
if we could actually, there's not one person in this room that's as clever as all of us. And if we could actually connect, and that's one of the reasons we're doing the Spark Labs, connect people, connect those ideas. Everybody's got the next part of the puzzle to make some part of the story work. And so for me, living under the railway bridge, um, it was... Um, it was, it was great from a knowledge perspective because I was going to the Tate Art Gallery and learning about how customers uh, imbibe information. I still that, use that today when I design packaging. So I know what colours you like, I know what font you like, and I know how you read information. So I'm very customer-centric. And, so, and I could do that because I was separated. I could actually watch my customers because I wasn't involved in this whole process. Um, it wasn't all beer and spittles because um, uh, I had no... Uh, cultural sort of social training at all. I, I never had a mum and a dad, didn't have any siblings. And so my only touchstones for how the world might work in things, important stuff like falling in love um, and getting married were the periodicals that I was delivering every Thursday in the council house estates on my bike. And those two periodicals were, um, the first one was Woman's Own, 1953. Brilliant! <laughs> Because if you want to know about falling in love, you know when you read Woman's Own that your heart would be pulsing, you could hear, hear your heart in your ears when the woman walked in the room, you wouldn't be able to speak when she was near you, and there'd be birds flying and bambies jumping around, and that's what love was about. Woman's Own, of course, the other touch that I had was Playboy magazine, and um, <laughs> so things didn't play out well, you know. Uh, but, but what happened, and this is the first part of your education, is for the first time when I was 14 years old, I made my first plan. And you've got to have a plan. We're the only species on the planet that know we're going to die, but does nothing about it. You were all born with 30,000 days, approximately. That's it. And you don't do that. You don't do the totting up of your checkbook, do you? You just sort of just think, just oh, I'm alive, and I'll just go around, wandering around the world. And of course, it's all. If you don't have a plan. What happens when you have a plan? And Because if you have a business plan, you would if you were starting a business, wouldn't you? You wouldn't start a business and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, you know, it'll just be a random series of things that'll happen. But when you start a business, what you do is you plan for... The best way to start a business is to think about the exit strategy. Even before you start the beginning of the company, think about your exit strategy, because that exit strategy will tell you how to design that business. So, for instance, if you're going to do an IPO, you may not have to get any sales at all. You may just want to develop technology, which you can then license or do a trade sale. But if you're going to get a marketing company, if you want to actually um, develop a marketing company and then actually sell that to Samsung or somebody, then you need to have a different strategy. So you need to think about the business from the back end of the business. And you would do that if you start a business. You need to do the same thing about your life. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is one of you will get on a plane and go to Perth and you'll meet this guy or a girl in a pub in Perth and before you know it, you're living in Australia. And that's not good. Uh, <laughs> so, so you don't, but if you've got a plan, two things happen. One is that you actually are more successful than all of your contemporaries because they haven't got plans. They're just wambling around all over the place. But you've got a plan and that, because you've got a plan, you're actually structuring your life and what happens is you then set objectives. And by setting objectives, you actually are measuring yourself. It doesn't have to be a terrible thing. I mean, I know I've got 4,725 days left to live, but I know what I'm going to do with them. And so in that last 10 years of my life, I'm going to you know, really do some serious stuff, and I've got a whole bunch of people who are helping me do all that serious stuff because we've got a plan. I've got a succession plan. Even my funeral's planned and the music because I don't want some poor, some guy, you know, talking about me in, in a way that they think's right. So uh, I want to have the last say even when I'm being, you know, put in the, into the coffin. Probably as they open the coffin, a little poor will come out and say, I've got another idea. <laughs> uh, but, but so think about your life. It isn't a finite thing. Uh, and that's the best advice I can give you is to go home, do the 30,000 days, take off what you've got left and actually work what, what you're going to do with those ones. So my first plan, uh, living under the railway bridge, uh, usually I set 10 year plan. They're the big dream plan, dream ready big. So if you're going to start a business, think about what it's going to look like in 10 years time and think about it from a global perspective. Can I make this a global business? Because again, if you plan for that, it can be a global business. If you don't plan for it, it's harder to make a transition because you haven't got all the bricks in the right place if you haven't planned for it being global day one. Exit strategy and a plan for 10 years, that's your first strategy. At three years, what you typically do is, is attenuate that because you've learned stuff. You learn what's successful and not successful. So my first 10 year plan living under the railway bridge, having read uh, Women's Own and Playboy, um, was uh, my first 10 year plan was to make a shit pile of money. Because I thought if I was rich, then people would 
loved me they, and they think I was a good guy. And, if, and the second part of that, having not had any love in my life at all, um, then I thought if I could get as many women to love me as possible, that would be good. <laughs> and I gave that a shot for a decade. <laughs> my wife refers to these years as my tug of woods years, you know. <laughs> it's a bit unkind, actually. It was just my years of due diligence. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of due diligence going on. Um, it wasn't my fault, it was, it was the 60s, it was sex and drugs and rock and roll, you know. I didn't sing, didn't do drugs, so... Um, <laughs> but, but, but it was terrible because what happened was um, I I'd, I'd managed to start up a, a business which ended up after seven years I had a laboratory in London and a laboratory in Canterbury, halfway between London and Dover, and one in Dover. And I used to work 14 to 16 hours a day and the only place that you could get something to eat after you knocked off work at 10 o'clock was a disco and that was where the women bit came in you see so so before I knew it seven years later I had a string of girlfriends in London that didn't know each other a string of girlfriends in Canterbury which didn't know each other and a string of girls in Dover didn't know each other <laughs> and it was just bloody tiring you know <laughs> the travel the travel you know anyway the but I had a character flaw in that, that stage because um, that was I hated acrimony. You know, I just really hated people crying. You know, if you've been in orphanages all your life, people crying and, you know, being upset. So I never broke up with any of them. <laughs> you do that for a decade. <laughs> Got a serious shit going on, you know. So thankfully, God or somebody intervened. I came round. I was taken to getting around London on a motorbike and um, I... Uh, went to work one morning and some idiot put a roundabout in the middle of the road where there wasn't one when I went to work and I came round in the dark and hit it and broke every bone in the left hand side of my body. I was in hospital for about six weeks and that was enough time for all those women to find me <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> they weren't happy. I left for New Zealand. <laughs> Why did you come to New Zealand, so Ray? What was the, the motivator for that? Well, what happened was I, I was running away from myself because all the, the best, having a plan doesn't mean you have to get it right day one. You know, not all your plans are going to be successful. But at least what I'd learned a lot about was how to build good businesses, you know. Um, and I hadn't found the salvation and the love that I thought I might find. So I really went on an adventure to find myself. I, I sold up everything and I knew I wasn't going back to England and uh, I went to find somewhere to live and I, I just... It took me about two years to get to New Zealand, travelling overland. Uh, I drove a bus from London to Camp Bendu with a whole bunch of Kiwis and Australians. Um, I lived a little bit of time in Sri Lanka and um, Nepal Eritrea and, and other countries. And um, for the first time in my life I saw abject poverty and I didn't know what to do about it at the time, but it had a profound effect on me. What I realised was that I'd had a glorious life really compared with some of these kids who would never have a shot at doing anything in their lives. So it had an effect on me and I got to New Zealand in 1973, literally having run out of land. I didn't plan to come here. But from the moment that I got here, um, literally within an hour, um, I fell in love with New Zealand because it's got certain characteristics that we have that nobody else has in the rest of the world. And it's important that you all understand this because this is the only country in the world where you can dream to be the person that you want to be. You know, it's, it's absolutely true. Anybody under the age of, say, 40 here is reasonably easy on the eye who wanted to go into politics could be the Prime Minister. As long as you don't go around, as long as you don't go around pulling people's hair, you'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> But, you know, if you've got a plan, you can. There's nothing to stop you. We don't have any social, any, any you know, if you, you couldn't do that in America, you couldn't do that in, in the UK. But in New Zealand, you can be anything. And I realise, and also the way that we think. Uh, we published a book about um, three years ago called The Power of Us, and it was about us, about what makes us different on the world stage. You don't know it, but we are the most innovative country in the world. And I say that as a scientist and, and knowing what we, how, how billions of people right now are using our technology. You don't know it and you've never been educated and it. You should. At school you should be taught how clever we are as a society. And I could see it. it it's that whole observation thing. Um, and it's how you learn stuff. Um, if I picked you all up now and took you to um, Seville and to my you know, favourite tapas restaurant there and you said, OK, guys, you've got to find your way to the tube station. It's kind of down there. You know, you've got to find your own way. You would. You know, you'd, you'd eventually find your way to that tube station. And if you had to go there every day, you'd learn a little bit more on that journey every day. N nobody knows how you learn that stuff, but you do. And it's just watching. You just see things. You know the street sign. You remember that shop. And your brain, that's how you learn stuff. 
just by observation. You know, you don't learn it necessarily just out of a book and learn the theory of it. You learn through seeing stuff and putting those bits of information together. And so that's the first thing, is to recognise that you're a learning machine. You're all possible. Uh, and you're also um, natural inventors. But you've had that educated out of you by this education system, which basically made, meant that instead of you thinking about observation as a key to seeing stuff, you were actually made to be processed as a whole bunch of people so that you were processed as a certain size package that fits through a certain size letterbox. And that's what it ends at CS or whatever it is. But there's not a, a skeret of imagination about how you would go out and search for ideas. And it's all inventions come down and you're all capable of it. And so a very simple example was there was a guy in the Swiss Alps and his dog came back to him and he was covered in all these cockle burrs, these little seeds that were just stuck on. They were on his trousers as well. And they were very hard to get off. Went home, looked under his kid's microscope and saw that these outsides of these seeds had all these little hooks like that. And he was the guy that invented Velcro. And he didn't, that's all, you know, just one moment of observation. And most inventions that we have simply come about through you seeing that. So you're all capable of doing that, and you've got to, but in our normal lives, you're so predicated on what you're doing, the immediacy of what you're doing, you don't stop and think about things. There were four, three guys, um, for instance, who were stuck in France, in, in Paris, and they, they were uh, Americans, and they'd been out all night on the piss, and they had up some problems. And their problems were they didn't know the number of the local cab company. And even if they did, they didn't have any local currency. And they actually didn't know quite where they were. <laughs> so they invented Uber because they satisfied three customer statement of need. And that's what you have to do. You have to find a customer statement of need by observation. And then if you fill that, you've got a good business. So for me, um, when I came to New Zealand, I could see, as I just saw the opportunity in New Zealand. Within an hour of arrival, what happened was I knew that New Zealanders were completely different. I, I got to the curb and um, this guy I met on the plane, he had his, uh, his wife was meeting at the airport, and, but he referred to his wife as mum. He said, mum's meeting us at the airport and we'll give you a lift home and show you around Auckland tomorrow. And that was my first nomenclature problem, because mum in England is your mum, and that's the end of the story. So when he got to the curb and started passing this woman who looked old enough to be a sister, <laughs> I thought, hello, there's a bit of Julian Banjos going to New Zealand land, you know. <laughs> They're not completely right. But it, but it got better because he was going to give me a lift home in this Mini. It was an 850 Mini, and what he didn't know was his mother and father-in-law had come up from Christchurch. And they were in the back of the car. They brought their luggage with them. The boot was full. There was no roof rack on this the late 50 Mini. And he had two large suitcases. I had all these rucksacks and camping paraphernalia. And at that stage in my life, coming from good old England, I'd been educated at some of the best colleges in London. And so when I got to New Zealand, got to the airport, saw this diaspora. I mean, I knew about physics, volume and mass. I knew there was no way on God's earth we're going anywhere in this vehicle. <laughs> Technically not doable. Anyway, driving on the southern motorway. <laughs> And the old boy's been sitting in the front, he's got one suitcase like that and the other one on the roof, like that. The young guy's got all of the rucksacks like this and, uh, and we're driving along the motorway. And I'm in the back like a Malteser with all the girls. <laughs> and that's when I knew within an hour of arrival in New Zealand, impossible is just a starting point uh, for Kiwis. And it's true, none of the things that I'd ever done on the world stage I would have done if I hadn't come to New Zealand. And my osmosis to become a Kiwi was just... Um, just that osmosis, it happened over the next three or four months. Um, so the first law of New Zealanders is that they're not fond of rules. We're not fond of rules. And if you don't believe that, anybody, just, uh, we haven't got any cameras on anybody, um, but uh, who's got a deck they haven't got a permit for, you know? <laughs> it's about a metre, that's fine. <laughs> you know, so that's what we do, don't we? You don't care a shit. You know, uh, uh, so that was the first law, and I understood that when I first came to New Zealand because I bought houses in New Zealand because in Auckland because uh, prices were doubling overnight, and um, I decided that I'd renovate one of these houses because I was bored and didn't know what to do, and it had a, a big basement, but it, it had a little bit that you could get up the back, but I needed to dig it out, so being an idiot, I decided to dig it out with a Kango hammer. And if you ever try to do that, you know that the Kango hammer goes in past the hasp that separates the tool from the machine, and it jams itself in the mountain. So now you're paying $7.50 a day for a sculpture. And I couldn't get it out, so I had to get another one to dig that one out. And that went in past the hasp that separates the tool from the machine and jammed itself into the mountain next to that one. And that was now costing me $37.50 uh, for two sculptures. So being a scientist, I got that big, one of those big green ones. And that changed everything because, not that I used it, because Jack, this New Zealander, came over 
with a cigarette in the corner of his mouth, which I never saw him take out in the ten years I knew him before he died. Uh, and he came over and he said, what are you trying to do, boy? He said, I'm trying to dig out the basement, put in a four-car garage. Won't do it like that, mate. He said, I am now. I'll look. <laughs> he said, come and look at my place. And we went across to his place and the, the whole basement was gone. It was just like a piece of butter had been taken away from the mountain. It wasn't even any tall marks. It was just gone. And I said, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I want to do. How do you do that? Dynamite. <laughs> I said, isn't that dangerous? He said, no, no, a few tires still. Mum was upstairs, that's his wife doing the washing up. Poof. A few floorboards, a few floorboards popped up. She complained about slippers getting stuffed on nails, banged them down all sweet, I'll do your place. <laughs> and he did. And that's what you guys are like. You just don't care, you know, you just do stuff. You know, like the, the job needed to be done. And that's what gives us an edge on the world stage. And if you take that fast forward to how that might work in business, so who's heard of Rocket Lab? Rocket Lab? Okay, so the young guy, uh, when I first met him, he was um, in uh, a basement uh, R&D lab in uh, Parnell, and it was, he had a rocket in the corridor. And what happened was, uh, Stephen Tindall walked past um, with me and said, what's that? And I said, well, there's a guy who's got this rocket stuff, and he's going to put a rocket up into the atmosphere to deploy um, satellites. And so Stephen ended up in investing in that, and then Goesler, and now, now Lockheed. So it's... Uh, a multi-million dollar company. In fact, we have more rocket scientists now per head of population than any other country in the world. But what happened to begin with was he went down to the Rocky Gulf and put a rocket up into the stratosphere. <laughs> you can't do that. No private individual can do that anywhere else in the world. He didn't even have a permit. The first two times he did it, <laughs> didn't have a permit. Just went... <laughs> if you were trying to do that in America, uh, the FBI would be around your place with tracker dogs and you get locked up. And in Australia, the air traffic controllers would want to know where it's going to land. We've no bloody idea where it landed, you know. <laughs> that wasn't the point. He was just testing the propulsion system. And it's that kind of thinking that makes us different, that makes us adventurous. Um, and it's that, okay, it's that what I call, it's, the, it's what I call the, the Kiwi, okay. And so if somebody asks you to do something impossible in, in any other country, everybody goes, you go get somebody in, the, in, in, in uh, um in the UK to come and paint the cathedral, for instance, and a guy would come with a, four guys with a, a, a van and, and, and a machinery mainly to make tea, and blow torches to make tea, and they'd look at this, they'd look, they'd look at the cathedral and say, that's a big job, Gov. Ooh, you know, it'd take years to do that, Gov. But if you ask the Kiwi to do that, they'd go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah. And so I developed that okay kind of ideology, which, open the uh, Pandora's box because I could do stuff that I probably never thought that I could do in the UK. Um, and I'd been adventurous enough in the UK, but I could do stuff now that would affect uh, people on a global scale because I had this team of people around me that thought differently. So the three characteristics are the first one is we're not final rules. The second one is that we have no respect for the status quo. And if you think about that in the context of um, anybody know Bill Buckley? Bill Buckley? Okay, there's just two people at the back. You all should know Bill Buckley, and that's part of this global um, innovation that we have. Uh, Bill Buckley uh, makes 90% of the electromagnets that fire up the photon chips uh, in your displays for your flat screen TV or your mobile phone. It's not a company in Silicon Valley, it's a guy in South Auckland who makes 90% of the equipment that makes the rest of the world works with photon displays. Okay? We should know that. We should be proud of that. And in typical Kiwi fashion, uh, he's, he's, he's a Speedway guy. Um, he's got seven kids. Uh, he's, um, he's, he wears an Einstein tie. And he, he would drive his Aston Martin car, uh, except that he's, he's had his licence taken away for speeding too much. That goes back to law number one, not fond of rules. As he told the policeman, <laughs> he told the policeman, I can drive this at 360 miles an hour and it's perfectly safe. Um, but anyway, um, but they took his licence off, so his wife drives him to work every day. But, but that's what... Kiwis are like. Now what he's done now, which is a game changing, is he's using that same technology to revolutionise the way we treat cancer. So what he's doing is using those fo same photons which he can you know, put into your, uh, your body, which are much safer than radiotherapy. And you just take a drink of liquid, the cancer cells absorb that liquid and these photons basically fry those, those, those things. And what happened was somebody from the physics lab came to him 20 years ago and said, the machines that we use to fire up chips are the size of a suitcase and it takes days to process these, these things. I want you to build a machine the size of this room so we can process millions of chips in a few minutes. And he said, okay. 
<laughs> and then when somebody came to him and said, could we use these, I've got an idea for using these things for treating cancer, and he said, okay. So for me, that's the, the bit that makes us different. We're not, one of the things that stop people from doing things is fear. You know, fear of starting or fear of failure. And fear, what I've learned about fear is that it's, a, um, it's an irrational thought because it's something, you're frightened of something that might happen. It hasn't happened. And it probably won't happen. But we're kind of pre-programmed to be frightened and have flight reflex and so on. So, and we've also don't have the belief in us as a, a community. The education system made you actually think like individuals. When you, when you were sent to school, the metrics that were originally designed to see how you were doing, you know, how you're doing with your contemporaries, which meant that we could attenuate your training, got quite reversed. And what that metric now is a pass-fail gauge, that's all. So you, get, you, you feel you failed if you don't pass those exams. And that means that you've set up this system for companies to actually try and compete against each other because you've been groomed through your education system to be competitive with each other rather than work together as groups. But as kids, you actually were totally designed to work together. In fact, we're um, genetically impregnated to work as social animals. You know, we used to all socially hunt and gather together. You know, and our education system and lifestyles have separated us out. So we need to, in, in companies, what we need to do is actually get back to that. So we build companies with people that treat each other like family, literally like family. Because you spend more working hours with the people that you work with than anybody else. And so if you start treating them like family and you start breaking down the cells that we have in organisations. So typically in a production company you have manufacturing, quality assurance. They're natural enemies, okay? Then you've got accounts. Everybody hates count, accounts, Christ, you know. So, but what if you can get them all to work together, okay? And you can do that. You don't, they still have to do their individual job and they're still secular, but you make those individual teams believe in their own individual teams. And then to integrate the other teams, what you do is you do something that can socially integrate them. So we're always running Douglas Pharmaceuticals. We had marketing, production, quality assurance, a whole range of different disciplines. But we would get them to compete after hours in indoor cricket matches or even dart matches at lunchtime or whatever. And that made them a family. They just laughed at each other. You know, I mean, the nerds, it turned out, the nerds could play darts really well, you know, um, but they were hopeless at indoor cricket, you know. Um, but they all laughed at each other and became a part of that family. And what you, happens then when you get that team, and I have a group of guys that work for me called my band of brothers, is that they become unassailable. They actually believe in the family. And even when things are tough, they will all dig deep and get the company out of the doo-doo because they actually have this absolute belief in the organisation that they're working for because they're treated like family as well. And the best advice I can give you for how you might mitigate those, um, those relationships is um, well, I do something um, with my staff every day and also I do it with my wife before I go to sleep every night. Not what you're thinking. Um, but what I... What I what, what I do is you, if you do this with the person that's your boss and the boss does it with the person that's his boss and so on. Everybody does it to the people either side of them. And it's kind of predicated on the Kaizen um, Kanban system, which means everybody in the company is your next customer. Okay, so, but but to, how do you evaluate how you're performing in your job relative to the people around you? So what we've come up with is you use three adjectives to describe that person at the end of each day, just as a person. How, they, how you feel about them. And it's very powerful, you know. Um, you know, you know I ask my wife at the end of the day how she feels and she'll tell me. Um, and if somebody's leaving my office, they will always shout over their shoulder these three adjectives. So they might say, uh, in, uh, intelligent, clever, and thoughtful. And then they might say one night, intelligent, clever, and complex. Now the next morning I want to see them because I don't want them to be lost. I don't want, them, I want to understand what they mean by that last adjective. And in doing that, because that's the engine of your business. Most people think that um, the business of managing a business is about external customers. But the most important customer in your life, day one, is the person you pull the blankets up with. Because if you don't get that right, you're in deep doo-doo. You can't function at the other job. And the next one is all of the people inside your company. They're the most important next part of the machinery that makes your business work. So you've got to concentrate on that. If you milk them and farm them like animals, they'll just leave and go off and get another job and they won't 
back your company. Um, so you can't do that. You have to make them all um, part of the family. And then the next one, of course, is the external customers. And the most important thing about your external customers is to always be customer-centric rather than product-centric. If you want, if you sell products, you'll go bust. You absolutely will. Do I have a Kodak moment? Kodak went bust. They had $68 billion worth of assets and turnover. It went bust because it didn't listen to its customers. Its customer base was changing from emulsion film technology to digital technology. And what did it do when the sales started to decrease? What it did, what most marketing product-centric companies do, increased its marketing budget. And eventually they ran out of money because nobody wanted their products. They'd moved on. And so they actually invented digital film in 1953. Didn't do anything about it. But if you listen to your customers all the time, and they're constantly changing, so you've got two things about your customer that you need to have foremost. Most people start businesses that don't have any customers. They come up with an idea for a product, and then they try and convince the rest of the world that that's a real product. I see hundreds of guys every year who come into my office, and I give them the time because you never know. There might be just one, one and there is. There's usually probably about 1% that are really stars. And, you know, we've made, made companies that have made millions of dollars out of some of these ideas. But most of them are what I call, I use the phrase, and the way that you, you, you write off these, um, uh, these businesses is by this one phrase, and it, it's, I'll get an extension. And, that's, and I, this is, you'll understand what that means in a minute. Because this guy came to me one day and he said, I've got a machine that's going to revolutionise cleaning. I said, okay, but what, what is it? And he showed me a picture. And it looked like a jetpack that somebody put on, the, on, their, on their back. And it was, it was a huge motor. And it had a huge hose about this big coming out. He said, this is the most powerful vacuum cleaner in the world. It will suck up a four-litre tin of Coke. I said, that's brilliant. I said, but who's the customer? Because, you know, the people have got indoor sweeping machines that are robotic and all sorts of things. What, who's the customer for this product? He said, well, Eden Park for a start, because a lot of rubbish after the, the rugby match there. And I said, but this thing's so big that it won't go up the aisles. He said, I'll get an extension. <laughs> and what people do is they keep modulating the product, and, and, but there really, it really isn't a customer. Okay? And so you can't sell things. If, so when you want to start a business, first thing you have to do is find a customer statement of need. Okay, Because if enough customers have got that problem and you've got a solution for that problem, then you've got a business. So there was, um, you know, some guys were, were flatting in the US and they had a spare room and they sudden, one of them woke up and thought, shit, if I could make this a, a Airbnb, I could make a business out of this. They, just that one moment of observation, he knew there was a whole bunch of people like him that just wanted to travel, you know, in a better, more easy way. And that the mobile phone allowed him to do that, allowed that technology. But that comes to the second part of the question is you need to identify your customer statement of need, but it also needs to be understanding your customer's current situation, okay? Because... You, you know, in the worst case scenario, you could be, um, you know, going into a guy's office and you're trying to sell him something um, um, and his mother's just died, you know, and that timing is wrong, you know. But so the timing of your business, it isn't, you know, there's, there's a guy in America who's wrote a, a whole book about his belief is that successful businesses are only predicated on one thing and that's timing, you know, that your timing of starting your business has to be the right timing. I think that's the outfall of not understanding your customer statement of need and its current situation analysis. In other words, look down at the customer and see you won't fail in terms of timing if you do your homework because you can prevent that from happening because if you do the homework for your customer, nobody's... Um, so there's no point in going to try sell something if you don't understand his business because he might have more, be mortgaged up to the hilt and so he's not going to buy any machinery off you if, if he hasn't got any money. So you need to understand everything about your customer statement of need and his current situation and analysis and then you'll be able to sell those, person, those, those, those products. But I've always been selling... Um, customer solutions um, because that was the, the idea behind that started in the pharmaceutical industry where we were selling drugs, generic drugs against multinational drugs and they have to be the same, the FDA says they have to be the same and except the multinational companies had big marketing budgets so they had all big glossy brochures and they 
would go around saying, oh, diclofenac is much more trustworthy. And even if you go onto the TV these days, you'll see people saying that drugs are better if they're made by multinational companies. And we, were, we didn't have any brochures. We actually have a price list. And when we started Douglas Pharmaceuticals, um, there were five multinational companies making drugs in New Zealand, Smith, Klein, Beach and Glaxo. Today there are none. And Douglas Manufacturing does all of the contract manufacturing for those companies. Um, and so how did a small generic company beat the multinational companies? Simply because we never tried to sell products ever. Because it's hard to sell a product that's identical to another product. You know, it's like selling a car that's identical. You, know, you can only do it on price, maybe differential. So we never tried to do that. We went to the pharmacist and said, what do you want? And they said, well, we'd like one month's interest-free credit so that we can have a bit more cash in our business to help build our business. We said we, could, we went to the bank, sorted that out. They said we'd like bonus stocks. So if they bought 10, they get two for free. And so we thought that was a great idea because we have more of our product on the shelves. So we dug deep and we helped them but we help them in partnership to build their businesses. And even in terms of that very, this is going to sound very sexist, but it's, it's not sexist, it's just um, the power of observation and customer statement of need. But we realised that when we had, um, we had a whole bunch of really good looking guys like you um, as reps going around knocking on the doors of the doctors. This was a doctor who just come out of somebody's bottom or out of somebody's um, brain. And what we recognised was the last person he wanted to see at the end of the day uh, was a nice um, you know, guy in a suit or in some cases we had these very young spotty kids. You know, that were, but what they wanted was somebody who had empathy. So we, we started swapping out our reps for female reps and they weren't um, trying to sell their femininity. They were just selling a customer statement of need which was they, they need, these guys needed to have some sympathy at the end of the day. So the first thing that these reps would be trained to do when they saw that guy was not try and sell a product, just simply say, how are, you? How are you, Brian? You look a bit tired, Brian. And of course, Brian felt that he was part of that company and therefore he would then talk and they could eventually start talking about the products and what he needed and blah, blah, blah. So you must understand your customer's statement of need and their situation analysis. Situation analysis for those, most of those surgeons was they, didn't, they were tired, they really wanted to go home, but they felt that they had to keep up to the play with what drugs were available for them. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to think about... Um, that um, the last thing that uh, that we're um, that makes us different is um, that we dare to dream. We actually dare to dream. New Zealand is one of those few countries in the world where we dare to dream, and and, we, and as a consequence of that, as I said before, billions of people are using our technology. And again, if you put some of these stories together, um, who's heard of Colin Murdoch? Anybody heard of Colin Murdoch? You have one person, two people. Everybody in this room has been touched by Colin Murdoch, and he had that one simple moment of observation and changed the world forever uh, in terms of healthcare. He was writing a uh, shopping list for, for the supermarket and the big pen he had stopped working. You could see a little tiny bit of ink at the end but he couldn't get it out so he got some matchsticks, put them down the end to get that last little bit of ink out so he could get right. Remember this was 1957 so you'd have to go a long way to the dairy you know. So um, he went into the garage, fired up the lathe and uh, when I'm telling this story at TED conferences in America I say every Kiwi's got a lathe in the garage and he fired up the lathe and made the world's first plastic disposable hypodermic syringe which changed global health care. And that, so everybody in the world has been touched by Colin Murdoch, including you. In fact, in 1957, when I was at the orphanages, I was lined up and I was getting my BCG jab. And in those days, of course, we are all using glass syringes. We didn't know about AIDS either, so we used to have the same needle. So the whole school was lined up in alphabetical order and they just went down the whole line with the same bloody 50cc syringe and the same needle. And I was bloody glad my name was Avery, you know. <laughs> I've got two daughters, they're called Amelia and Anastasia, you know, because these things stay with you. Uh, <laughs> but the point is that he just changed the materials of construction of that device, but it made it universal, because before that we had to have all these factories for cleaning these syringes with detergent, distilled water, drying them, and so he, he got rid of a whole industry. And that's the other thing that you need to be aware of with your businesses, is what's happening with disruption. Not only what's happening with disruption, um, in the immediacy of your business, but what's happening with societal disruption. Because you can have a, a good product that's based on a good customer statement of need, but it may not get deployed for a whole number of reasons that are to do with 
a wider customer statement of need. And, and I'll give you, I call it embedded and unembedded systems. If you've got an unembedded system, it could be something like a mobile phone. So I can make a mobile phone, I can make any app that I like on this, and I can put it up on the web and you can buy it. It's, it's a relationship between you and me. There's no third party involved in that process. So in an embedded system, there's a third party, like a regulatory body, like transportation, um, telecommunications, um, and a whole range of other medical uh, industries. So once you get a third party involved, then it's much more difficult because they can make your business much slower to get adopted. Uh, because of the technology and the risks. So if you think you're going to be driving around in, in uh, driverless cars in 2020 or even 2025, you're not. And why won't you? Well, because there are so many different um, regulatory in, you know, inferences that are embedded that are going to make it more difficult. So first thing is insurance. I mean, who is responsible for the fact that that car drives into a lot of kids at the, at the crossing? Who's the person that's legally, is it the software people? Is it the people who license that technology car to be allowed on the road? Is it you as a driver? So that's all got to be worked through in terms of whether you can use that technology. If you have unembedded technologies, they slip between these things. So if you look at what's happened with lighting, uh, lighting, we had incandescent lights uh, for about 100 years or 150 years. These are just normal bulbs, you know. They still, you still buy them today, but they were overwhelmed by um, halogen lights. And you could actually swap out pretty much in your ceiling light a halogen light for an incandescent bulb. And now what's happened is you can now swap that out with an LED. And because you can swap them out, you get an unembedded market uptake. And so that disruption is allowed to happen. Right now we've got disruptive technology, for instance, that I can put a... Uh, a rail through this whole building, which is an induction charging. I can Velcro my lights on anywhere I like, and I can use my mobile phone to switch them on and off. That exists. And if I invested in a business like that, I'd go bankrupt. The reason, because who's going to put it in? Because the problem is that the, the people that are putting copper wire in want to put copper wire in, you know, the electricians. And there's also building codes to be considered and other things. So it's going to take a long time for some technologies that we have to really get so think about that. The other thing that we do, I do a thing called failure mode cause risk analysis. What that means is what shit can happen, you know. And I'm the expert at that, you know, because I didn't get married till I was 60. You know, I did a lot of risk analysis um, and a lot of due diligence. Um, but, but the point is I think about what can go wrong, not just in my business, but what's happening with society, you know. And, and that's where some of these people, Airbnb, reflected on a society change, that that's what people wanted. They wanted that flexibility, um, whether it be things like Tinder or whatever, you know, um, people find an ecological niche in the way that society is changing. But there are also physiological things that we need to know about our planet. So you, if you know anything about the petrol industry, you'll know that petrol sales are declining. Petrol sales are declining because you're not going out as much. You're dialing in everything. You're dialing in your peaches, dialing in your countdown things. You don't need to go to the bank anymore. And his parking's wretched anyway, so da 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 da. So society's changing. So we look at all of those demographics and, and try and put a metrics around those. One of the things I know as a scientist is that, um, and this is what you want to consider, if anything, any of your technologies that you're working on have um, anything embedded in, say, lithium ion batteries or uh, mobile phone technology, what you need to know is that in 20 years' time, all that technology is going to cost a ship part more money. And how do I know that? Well, in the world, there are, um, we, we have 26 rare earths that go in to make all of these components. 98% of the world's supply is in China, and it's finite. That's the one where they've got 20 to 30% purity. The rest of the world's got 2 to 3% purity. We won't necessarily run out of these rare earths, but the price is going to skyrocket as we start to use up these natural resources, just as we did with the petrochemical industry. So we factor that into our business. So we know with some of our medical care technology that we can afford to double the price of our hardware and still make a profit. So you need to think about all those other things, because otherwise what's going to happen is your business will be overwhelmed. And so you've got to try and think about that other weather eye that life has. So it might have seemed like a really cool idea to invest in NABMAN, but now NABMAN's really going to the wall because the reality is that your mobile phone will do that, that job. And most car manufacturers are using their own OEM manufacturers to put sat-nav into their cars. So you've got to see what, what disruptive technology could catch out your business 
you know. Um, so again, it's understanding customer statement of need and what's happening with the world at large that would affect my idea of a successful business. But always focus on the customer and the customer statement of need. So Ray, we've got a range of questions sure. that have come in. Um, uh, people didn't want to interrupt uh, you, so they right. didn't raise their hands. Okay, yeah. They were engrossed. Can I just get a raise, uh, raise your hand if you've got a question that you'd like to ask? I've got quite a few here, but if you've got a question you want to ask yourself, just raise your hand now, just so we know. Okay, I'll deal to these ones first, and if you do want to uh, have a chat to Sir Ray, that's fine. First of all, um, in terms of building this, this team culture, mm. What are your thoughts on individual performance bonuses? Do they undermine a collaborative culture? Well, we don't have any of those things in our businesses. Um, the, um, the, uh, the thing about what, when you build a family, um, it's almost like having breakfast. You know, you're, you're, you know, breakfast is good to have breakfast with your family. So we have these almost <coughs> breakfast meetings. In fact, when you, you would, to try and get that culture right, if one of you was to join, one of my companies, um, we, you'd be joined at the end of the table and everybody would be sitting around the table and I'd say, welcome to vigil monitoring. Um, I'm dad and your job is to look after me and your job is to look after each other. And if one of you starts to show off and how clever you are against that person over there, you'll hear all the other people around the table put their hand in the air and start whistling like Superman because you think you're Superman. You're not, but we are. So we don't want to hear, have any of that individual kind of, because it, nobody's as clever as all of us. So if we focus on that, we make ourselves an unassailable team that nobody else can, can get at. And we look after each other. So in the business, we extend that to the business strategic planning. So what we do is we have everybody in the room and say, okay, this is, where, this is the, we've tried to come up with very simple metrics to show what's happening with the business. In fact, every week, all the departments really just do one graph that sort of shows where they're at, whether they're above the line or below the line. And we look at that line together and say, okay, look, we've, we've had a fantastic year, you know, and we've got this, you know, Samsung deal coming up and this could do this. These are the options for you guys. You can take a, you, we can give you a shareholding in the company so you feel part of the family, you can have a shareholding in the company and this is what that would look like. Or you can have a bonus, you can have your bonus, or, but you guys decide, so we don't decide at all. And they decide. And similarly, if, type, if things are getting tough uh, in a company, and some, no company that I've ever had has gone from A to B, uh, B is the plan, but usually it, either you should be fired, in some cases I've had companies that have gone right up to A, you know, just, they've just gone up like a, and that means I've got it horribly wrong, but it's been really successful. But then sometimes, mostly they just go down and up below the line and, you know, eventually things, you know, you have to live through. You know, failure for successful people is just the cul-de-sac on the way to success. Because it happens, it will happen. It inevitably will happen, something won't work. But it's how you deal with that. And so if you learn from it and fix it. So we, when we get above the line, uh, if, if things are tough, we say to the guys, how do we deal with this? So then they share in that, that dilemma. And we say, so you, you know, if it's really acute, uh, we don't want to lose you. So anybody want to take a holiday, like for, for a month or two months while we get the cash flow sorted out or, or whatever. And in some cases, um, even those employees have put money into the business because they believed in the business and they could see that they were part of the business and they put money in and some of those made a, a significant amount of money. So that's how we deal with it. We, um, and, and what happens is when you do this is you get this X factor that nobody can usurp. And a good example of this, when I was in Eritrea at the end of the 30-year war of independence, um, the MIGs came over and bombed our warehouse and munted all of our very high-tech stainless steel ductwork to build this interocular lens factory for making uh, cataract lenses. And I didn't know what to do because um, I was going to have to send these guys back over land through the sedan. It would take three months to get new equipment made and probably six months delaying the whole project. And I was toying up whether, you know, what to do. Um, and um, so I do what I normally do in those situations when the shit's really hit the fan. Uh, I drink half a bottle of whiskey. Um, I find it takes the edge off, you know. But some people call it sleeping on it. Um, but, 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 but I do, literally. I just have a bit of a moment, take a moment. While I was doing that, and I went upstairs and, 
um, started writing some notes and my boys took off, my band of brothers took off in their utes. I knew there was no aluminium ducting. We could have used aluminium to form ducting if we had any aluminium, but there wasn't any in the whole country. So my boys took off in their trucks and their utes in the middle of the night and I just thought they were going down the pub or something. They took off. Anyway, in the morning when I got up, um, all I could hear was grinding and sanding and these guys had made formers and they're taking these huge sheets of aluminium and forming them into duct work. And I know there was new aluminium in the whole country. And as I walked across, to, I was about to say, where did you get these big sheets of aluminium? I could see that they were grinding off the motorway sign to Kerrin. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've been out all night knocking off all the motorway signs for the whole friggin' country. Because they're Kiwis, they didn't give a shit. You know? <laughs> Dad was upset, let's fix it. And if you go into the factory today, there's all this stainless steel ducting, but there's this one little plaque with all the signatures of all those guys. And that's what makes these teams unassailable. There's not one person in our organisation, which is a global organisation with 200 employees, who all who work for nothing, okay, all work for nothing. Um, and they believe in the one thing that's on the back of our business card, which is change the world. We have changed the world for millions of people and we will continue to do that because we all actually believe it. So you've got this X factor that you get if you get that team of people who actually believe in each other and look after each other. And that extends to, in, in some of the more successful companies, we actually, we know our employees um, tend to work too hard and too long. So we take a lot of the burden of the things that they have to do, like their dry cleaning, we deliver lunch to their desks, and we uh, make sure the kids are picked up from school and, and all sorts of things like that. So and we also make them go on holiday because they're part of our family. A couple of quick questions, Saray. Uh, Regina wants to know, what's the best advice you've ever been given in your life? Uh, I've been, oh, that's a good, very good question, actually, because... Um, um, I can't think of anything, because uh, um, in a way um, I've always lived my life as a, a, a unicellular animal, you know, I've always been separated from the world, um, and that's a good thing in that you can't get through all of that abuse if you uh, can't, you have to put it in a box and, and seal it all up, and so what I've learned in life is that um, uh, absolute happiness and absolute sadness are both imposters, you know, because you know, the days go like this, you know. So I'm much more Buddhist, Buddha-esque in my perspective. I just, I'm, you know, I'm kind of moderately happy all the time, you know. Um, and, and that is a safety net in terms of when the shit's, because shit's going to happen tomorrow, you know. Um, and I try and mitigate anything, everything as much as I can. Um, but, um, you know, my daughter broke a leg the other day and that was an unforeseen. Um, I literally left a board meeting and said, I've got to literally go and pick up my daughter. Uh, <laughs> I had to pick her up. Um, but, but, you know, uh, in terms of the best advice, I, what I can, I think, in, to answer the question though, um, uh, I would take. Um, uh, this from other people that I know that have been successful entrepreneurs, okay? People like um, um, Stephen Tyndall and um, uh, uh, other, other, you know, uh, entrepreneurs that um, have really started from a ground up sort of company. And, and the first thing is that do something that you love. That's the, the most important thing. Do something you love. You don't want to be, I used to be. A lot of people get into a career structure. They go to school um, and uh, go to one of the uh, class things afterwards about career booths. And you go to a particular career booth and you go to that. And before you know it, you're working in architecture. And then when you're at you know, 65 years old and you've you know, sold your practice, you do what you really wanted to do all, all along, which is have a vineyard, you know, and you start a vineyard. So think about the, the 30,000 days, think about what you love to do and find a way of doing that which can make enough money to make you happy and successful at what you do. So have a plan and do something you love. I mean, I, I love playing with stuff and I've just turned it into a good business in terms of uh, making products that are good for us and our society. That's the only other caveat I'd ask you to think about is um, just do a, a, a kind of litmus test on the business you're going into and say, is this a good business for us as a species and uh, us as a society and, and our environment? You know, because it's very easy to get lost and make something that really actually is not good for us. And that's how we got into this. I mean, we make most of our products for um, 
balancing the disequity in healthcare in developing countries. They don't get a shot at reasonable healthcare, but we've come up with cool technologies that can do that. Same, and many of, the, many of those products we can sell in New Zealand as well and just bring down the cost of drugs and medicines. So, but the best advice that most of these people like Richard Branson would give you is absolutely do something that you love and, and don't be distracted by what people say, other people say. You know, because other people say you're mad. Typically, they do say you're mad when you start most businesses. Uh, but if you have that belief in yourself and you get... What you have to do, though, is have a plan. You've got to have a plan. And what you need to know is, look, at you know yourself better than anybody else. So the best advice that I might give you would be, um, as, you know, this is not um, advice that somebody's given me, but the best advice I could give you would be um, to have your plan and then have a really good look at yourself and find out where your weaknesses are and then surround yourself with people who fill those weakness gaps mm. and then you're really really safe because you're the one that's got the passion uh, you have to have a leader but what a leader does a good leader is somebody who just builds great teams and that's his job is to build great teams and to use that collegiate intelligentsia um, Right now, when we look at the, the whole world at large, um, we, it really is predicated on that one truism that leadership actually is about um, somebody who um, shows and exhibits the hopes and dreams of a particular society at a particular point in time. And that can be really bad, like Trump in the US right now, <laughs> because he's pandering to a society that's really munted, you know. Um, and so, but a good leader is somebody who looks after his his customers and his people, you know, the people that work for him. So that's my job. My job every day is to get up and make sure that my team are happy because they're the engine that drives the machinery. Um, and also, um, that's, that's the three adjectives that I'm looking for at, each, at the end of each day. I want to be a good boss, so I have to be measured by um, my team. Uh, and hopefully I get it right. Um, and it's uh, very humbling for me that these guys will go out in the middle of the night and knock off motorway signs or whatever they, whatever they need to do to make sure Dad's happy. Uh, we haven't robbed any banks, but it's on the cards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one last question. I know we're out of time. A number of people have um, mm. uh, clearly shown a lot of uh, interest in your concerns about the education system and, mm. and, and its failings. Um, beyond the education system for parents, what advice would you give them if they want to uh, grab the bull by the horns and do their bit to help encourage their kids to dream big and think in more innovative ways? Right. Well, that's a very important thing. And I've got two kids. I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. And I'm very, you know, for me, I used to watch the youngest one um, when she went to preschool and she would have allowed to put out all the drawers and play with everything and make things and put them together. And then when she went to proper school, she, had, she was standardised. She had to put a school uniform on and, and one day she came out of school and I was carrying a rucksack for her and helping across the road and she suddenly freaked out and said, oh, shit, I've got to put my cap on. Because she would get told off if she wasn't wearing her cap in the main street. And that's what happens. You, you know, you get that... Um, dumbing down of your individuality and the way that you think. So the, the thing that parents can do is expand that all of that outside of uh, schooling. Uh, and the way that I do it, I don't want my kids to be scientists, but what I do is I show them shit. You know, I, 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 you, you do this yourself. If you want to do some really serious shit, this is, if you've got kids, this is a real, a real killer. Just get some washing up liquid and put it into a small bowl and then get uh, some lighter fluid, you know, the stuff that's the gas stuff, and, and put that into the bottom like that. And then set fire to it and just... And you can actually pick it up with your hands and it won't burn your hands. I mean, that's a real killer, real show-off stuff. Um, another thing that I... What, what I did the other day with my, my two girls, I said, I'm going to show you how a rocket works, you know. And uh, so I bought a 2995 Rocket Lab um, thing, it was, and it was just a little rocket. You fill it up with um, sodium bicarbonate and vinegar, and you shake it, and the CO2 produced makes it go off, right? This went... Pfft. It's like premature ejaculation. That was just rubbish, you know. So I said to the girls, I'll show you a rocket. So I got a 44-gallon drum and uh, <laughs> I put, in, put in 25 kgs of citric acid and, and put a monolayer in there. And then I got my 
Ryobi drill and stuck that in there. And I got the same little rocket and I aerodited it with five minute aerodite onto the top. So I wanted enough resistance that this thing was really going to go off. And I knew that it was going to clear the fence at least. Um, so we had the girls write the name of the man on the moon on the side. And they were pressed against the side of the house with their swimming goggles on. <laughs> Cape Canaveral, and I said, this is really going to go, and I started the, the Ryobi drill, and the fucking thing exploded, <laughs> and I was just covered in a sea of foam, the, the house was, it was a huge bang, and the, the kids were the foam coming down over them, and coming down over the windows, mum came out, and she said, what's going on, and, and I looked at the kids, and I said, are you guys okay, and they said, that was brilliant, dad, do it again. <laughs> And that's what you need to do with your kids, is to play with your kids and show them the world. And, that, you know, because at school, they don't have any fun anymore. You know, that once they get to be six, then they're now in this whole process where they're being measured. And, and innovation, kids are natural innovators. If my daughter would often go off into a park and come back with um, a, a, another girl, and um, I'd say, who's this? And she said, this is my new best friend. I said, that's brilliant. What's her name? I don't know. <laughs> but what happens to us is we end up in what I call the lift syndrome. You get in a lift at our age and it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, we've got this whole journey like 17 floors <laughs> and nobody talks to each other. And that's what the education system's done to us. We haven't, and it's only does speak to you, you think, oh, shit, <laughs> they're mad. Um, so we've got to change that for our kids. And, and you know, what I'd like to see is um, innovation put on the curriculum. Uh, the only way the way that innovation gets onto curriculum nowadays is usually art or dance right at the bottom. But I think innovation should be, how do we understand the way that the world works? We should have an education system that educates Kiwis that billions of people around the world are using Kiwi technology. There's not one animation movie that you see that's not embedded in weather workshops. You've all been injected with Kiwi technology and we invent stuff that's um, jet boats and um, all sorts of technology that should be used. If, when, when, when the uh, Rugby World Cup we won that and, and the whistle was blown. I was doubly pleased because, of course, we won against the Australians. My wife's Greek Australian. Uh, and, but, but, but better still, I knew that the whistle that was blown at the end of it was also invented by a Kiwi. So this is so much in the trigger mechanism for a paintball gun invented by a Kiwi. So we are the most innovative country in the whole world. Our innovation index on the world stage is it's about number 13, but the winner of the innovation globally is Switzerland. But it's an unfair metric because they've got 2,978 patents for one watch mechanism, and that's how they measure the innovation quotient. So, so it's unfair. Um, the reality is that in terms of how we influence the world at large, I mean, there are 20 million people who can see because of the technology that I invented around uh, lens technology. And so we think that our nutritional products, which is Kiwi technology, uh, patented, um, will affect half a billion kids in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. So we literally change the world. Um, and you should take pride in that. And if every kid knew that, they'd probably stand up and say, I'm going to make a rocket, Dad. So we've got to breed that kind of culture of belief and we do have them. That's what makes us those three things. We're not fond of rules. We have no respect for the status quo. And we dare to dream, despite what the education system tried to do to us, because we're Kiwis. Fantastic. So, Ray, we are going to have to leave it there. Um, by the way, I have a neighbour who I was chatting to over the weekend, and she said to me, she has just read Rebel with a Cause, and I know she's actually watching on the live stream this morning. She wanted me to pass on to you, this is Jude, mm. she wanted uh, to pass on to you um, her impressions from the book. She fell in love with you. She, f <laughs> she felt seduced by you, so you might have another woman later in life um, to have to contend with. But... Um, in all honesty, she said that she thinks you are the epitome of a living treasure in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, Saray, and your generosity, your inspiration, and your no-nonsense advice. Let's hear it for Saray Avery. <laughs> And a little gesture from Spark for your contribution. Well, thank you very fantastic. much. Good. Thank you, sir. Okay, take care. Cheers. Thank you. Now, uh, while I have your attention, just a couple of quick uh, notes. We have uh, our next speaker at 9.30, Will Palmer from Movio. Uh, he will take centre stage with a bit of a workshop-style uh, talk on uh, niche industries. How do you recognise an opportunity? And once you do, 
What do you do about it? And our last event at 5.30 today is on branding. Uh, Tracy Lee will be with us to share her valuable brand Yoda wisdom, how you uh, uh, define, refine and reinvent uh, a brand. So uh, you're very welcome to join us for those events either in the room or uh, on the live stream. Thank you again to the Spark customers in the room because as I said earlier, genuinely without you and your support, these events would not um, occur. And uh, just one last reminder about the Mobi site and some of those functions on that site. Um, plenty of networking and connecting opportunities are available on that site. Most importantly, the feedback function. Spark would love to get your feedback about um, any of the events that you attend as part of the series, our, our conversation with Sir Ray this morning. Um, how would you rate it? How would you improve it? Uh, and going forward, would you like Spark Lab to come back to Christchurch with uh, more, uh, more events and more series? Uh, if so, what sort of topics, what sort of speakers, what sort of genres would you like Spark Lab to zero in on? So any advice, any critiquing, any appraisals, they're all welcome uh, via that feedback function. As a wee carrot, if you do provide some feedback, you will be in to win $250 worth of uh, Spark credit, and someone in the audience has got to uh, win that. So feel free to use the feedback function before you leave the venue today. Uh, once again, thank you very much to Sir Ray Avery, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. Have a great day. Thank you.